Today I'm going to be speaking on um, money markets and morals because that's the theme of this entire week that we spent at the Chautauqua Institution. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, but you can't possibly take in everything that that place has to offer and I tried to do that early in the week. We arrived on Saturday, had a symphony on Saturday night, there's a, an orchestra which draws together uh, leading musicians from all across the country. When their symphonies close down for the season, they show up in Chautauqua. One of the members of that symphony in the timpani section has been there for 54 years. He's been playing in that orchestra every summer. So it draws uh, people from a wide variety of experience and, and brings together incredible levels of commitment in them uh, to be in that orchestra. So we listened to the orchestra on Saturday night, Sunday morning, Tony, Tony Campolo, a, a very well-known theologian in the States, uh, spoke uh, at the service and spoke every morning that week in a religious service held in this open-air amphitheater which will seat about 5,000 people. That evening, uh, there, was, uh, there were other events there. Monday, I went to three lectures. Tuesday, I went to four lectures. Wednesday, I couldn't go to a single lecture. I was completely done in at that point. Uh, but did pick up and went to several lectures uh, toward the end of the week as well. The Chautauqua Institution, as I said earlier, was started in the 1890s. It was when Sunday school was the only time, only place that people were educated. And so the Chautauqua Institution was the brainchild of a couple of men who brought people there, carved out an entire valley, uh, the uh, and Sea of Galilee, taught them biblical geography, uh, taught them uh, in the current literature of the time, uh, taught them music, because at those Sunday schools you weren't just learning about uh, biblical stuff back then. That's the only time that children often had any time to be exposed to any kind of education at all. And so teachers from across the country would show up at Chautauqua to be given information, to be taught, to be taught how to teach, and they would take that back to their communities and inform them and build their understanding. Over the course of the years, it has gone through bad times, but it has now uh, is established as uh, this institute that draws people together for nine weeks during the summer, each week focused on a different element. Uh, it offers uh, symphonies, it brings students uh, who are learning ballet, who are learning opera, who are learning musical instruments, uh, artists, pulls them together, teaches them with some of the leading teachers, and it's a phenomenal place to be. So this week there were some incredible speakers uh, there who were bringing perspectives on money markets and values. Uh, while that institution is, a, as I said, a gated community, you have to pay to get in, but you get all of those things free, other classes you can take if you pay separately for them. Scott and I stay at something called the Ecumenical Community of Chautauqua where you can stay in a single room for $135 a week and no air conditioning. You can pay a little bit more for a double. You can pay a little bit more for a double with a bathroom in the room. You can pay a little bit more for a room with a bathroom and your own kitchen. Everyone else cooks together in a basement kitchen. Uh, but still no air conditioning, just so you know. So it was a lovely week, uh, and uh, we really appreciate being able to go and, and steep ourselves in that experience with or without air conditioning. But I want to tell you a little bit about that subject, and I'm going to rely heavily on the article that Deb spoke to you at the Journal of Markets and Morality. Who'd have thought? There was a journal called the Journal of Markets and Morality, but there is. And Ryan Langrill, who is a graduate student, and I'm assuming one of his supporters, Victor Storr, an associate professor, uh, put this article together, which helped me get a grip on some of these ideas of uh, the market being a moral thing. There are basically three uh, perspectives on the market and morality. Uh, one, the first one is that, it's, uh, that it needs to be recognized as being of the moral order uh, because it creates social order. And so because it works in that way, we have to ascribe to it good or bad, that it can participate in our lives in that way. The other one is that it's part of the moral order because it's part of distributive justice. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but it keeps things in, in an even an appropriate way. And so because it functions in that manner, it can be good or bad. 
or there is the perspective that it has nothing to do with morals at all, that you cannot anthropomorphize something like the market, and so it's amoral or non-moral. Uh, when we talk about the social order, I want to think about the baker, a local baker, who bakes bread uh, and uh, in a small community might bake bread for absolutely everyone there. But the baker isn't doing that out of the goodness of their own heart, of course. They're doing that because they want to make money doing that, because they want to support their family, because they want to be able to purchase goods and to establish a sense of uh, confidence in their own security. And so the market allows people in their own self-centered needs to provide for the wider community. And so it is seen as a good thing. That's seen as a positive aspect to a market economy. That when I am selfishly wanting to care for myself, I will come up with some creative way to make something or provide something that you need and you will pay me for it. So my selfish need builds a positive social order. In a distributive justice concept uh, around the market, it's talking about uh, allocating resources to those who do the most work, the people who are the most efficient at producing the objects that you want uh, for their own selfish purposes will be end up will end up with more of the resources in their own pockets and be able to sustain themselves in a way beyond security, but into uh, some level of perhaps luxury. And so a distributive sense of a market uh, is that it is just that it will figure that out and balance all those things out. The concept that it can't be anthropomorphized and it can't actually be good or bad, that it's just there and it's good or bad people that function within it, uh, is another understanding of it and seems fairly clear to us. Uh, when, however, those who uh, control the markets, perhaps governments uh, who create uh, laws and processes by which uh, a market has to function, if it's functioning in that way, then it can be seen to be influenced by these laws, and so then it can be, you can attribute uh, good or bad to it based on what those laws look like. So those are the three major ways uh, that the market and morality are looked at. Now, the concept that was introduced in the reading that Deb uh, shared with you, and it's, it was kind of an out of the left field reading on economics and morals and it's a little hard to get your head around, but the ideas inherent in that are that if you are a good person, if you have good values, if you seek to work uh, in ways that are just, that you will be rewarded in the marketplace. That people will want to work for you because you are a just employer. And they will even maybe work for you for less than the guy down the street or the girl down the street if they're not very nice employers. If they work you too hard and this place can give you some decent hours, time off, uh, if your child is sick, uh, some benefits, you'll work for less money over here than you will over there. Uh, and so an employer who treats their employees equitably and fairly will attract better employees. It will also attract better customers because the customers will sense, you know, the goodwill in the, in the organization. Uh, the prices will be fair because no one will be wanting to rip anybody off. They're not in it for the just for all the money, they're in it for the money, of course, but they also want to reward the community and reward their customers. And so the sense of uh, just, a just interaction prevails in the organization and customers want to come back. Now, the other uh, values that are inherent in good business are, were touched on in that reading. Two, one is courage. Uh, one wouldn't think about courage, but when you think uh, in the sense of innovation or in the sense of opening up new markets or in the sense of uh, creating something, investigating, doing research, and then coming up with something that might be needed that had never been thought of before, you can see how that would need to be a courageous undertaking, that someone who is going to try to invent a new way for people to communicate or a new way for them to travel or a new way for them to uh, eat that they're stretching themselves in that way, having the hope that it will work out and the courage to make that happen and the passion to take it forward, all of those values end up rewarding the entrepreneur in that sense of a moral uh, economy. When we were at Chautauqua, some of the people that we 
he heard uh, speak, uh, maybe are well known to this congregation. Um, two of them have been the authors of books that have been looked at by the book study. One, Michael Sandel's book, Justice, was studied by the congregation last year. The whole idea of the week, Money, Markets and Morals, came out of Sandel's book, What Money Can't Buy. And he talks about, in that book, the things that money is starting to buy. That we have turned, out, turned away from having just a market economy to having a market society. And how, if you'd like, uh, some of the uh, examples that he gives in the book and gave in his speech at Chautauqua are uh, things like uh, time. Uh, time is becoming a precious commodity. So if you're taking your kids to Disneyland or to uh, Canada's Wonderland and you don't want to stand in that great big lineup, you know, put on extra sunscreen because you're going to be there for five hours, you can pay to go on the express line. And that way, you know, the people who can pay more get to use the ride faster and those who don't have to stand there. And that sounds, you know, sort of okay when you're standing in a long lineup at the airport and you watch all those first class people whip by like that. It can be a little annoying sometime. But imagine if you're trying to get some laws changed uh, in Parliament and there's going to be some public hearings and you get to the lineup at 8.30 on the morning of the public hearings and you see that there is a lineup of 150, which is the total number of people that can be allowed into the hearings, a lineup of 150 homeless people, each of whom has been paid a certain amount of money per hour to stand in that lineup for some lobbyist who is going to come in just as they unlock the door and let them in. So that the public doesn't actually get to participate in those hearings unless they're willing to fork, fork over the money to a homeless person or maybe one of their kids to stand in line. Uh, the going rate in Washington now is about 50 bucks an hour, but it can go up based on uh, how serious the situation is and what it is that's being lobbied. So Sandel is saying that we no longer market stuff. We market time, we market everything. Some people, uh, you can pay to have uh, advertising put on your forehead. These are all ways that we're crossing the line around what is appropriate and what is not. And Sandel, whose look at justice captivated uh, members of the congregation over the past year, looks at that with incredible clarity in his book, What Money Can't Buy. It's totally worth the read. The second day, uh, on Tuesday, we listened to David Brooks, who was an op-ed columnist for the Washington Post, and he brought to us uh, tales of different ways that people interact uh, in the world to, to bring their gifts uh, to work in the world, whether they bring them uh, and, and offer them uh, willingly and find their way uh, behind the scenes, uh, making things change, or whether they come in and act in a leadership role, and the stories that he told told were uh, profound and, uh, and very, very interesting. So uh, his work uh, brought a, sing a certain perspective as well. On Thursday, when I was strong enough to go for some more mental uh, and exercising, uh, George Packer, who's just published a book called Unwinding, The Unwinding, spoke. Now Packer brought a little more hard-hitting information, a little more specific information to the group that was listening to him. And his book is about how uh, the American government has unraveled, has unwound from what he called the Roosevelt, uh, started with an R, I can't remember, but the way that uh, the economy ran and government and, and private uh, interests functioned uh, for the last 70 years and the way that they have shift in the last, shifted in the last 10 to 15 years uh, with the deregulation of certain things, particularly bank, the banking industry in that country uh, and the challenges that that brought to the fore. He talked about the different levels of income and what it looked like uh, in the United States and the number that he gave, which uh, and he, it was interesting because I'd done quite a bit of reading on this and, and every now and then he'd come up with another statistics and, and 5,000 people would go, <gasps> and I was a bit surprised at that because this was information about their country that I thought that they had, and, but they didn't have that information. They were clearly surprised by it. Uh, but one of the statistics that everyone went <gasps> to was the fact that the Walmart family has enough wealth, has about the same amount of wealth as the lowest 42% of the population accumulated in the United States of America. 
So 42% of that population, if you have put all of their wealth together, that's the amount of wealth that is held in one family uh, in America. A lot of it the result of the dissolution of many of the regulations in the Glass-Steagall Act that had been put into place in 1933. So I'm going to show you a little video. Carrie's got it ready, cued and ready to go. Uh, this is a video obviously about what is happening in the United States uh, and it just puts into perspective some of the breakdown of income in the United States. Uh, and and then I want to talk a little bit about how uh, being good and those values, how that's not working anymore. So can we get that? There's a chart I saw recently that I can't get out of my head. A Harvard business professor and economist asked more than 5,000 Americans how they thought wealth was distributed in the United States. This is what they said they thought it was. Dividing the country into five rough groups of the top, bottom, and middle three 20% groups they asked people how they thought the wealth in this country was divided. Then he asked them what they thought was the ideal distribution. And 92%, that's at least 9 out of 10 of them, said it should be more like this. In other words, more equitable than they think it is. Now that fact is telling, admittedly, the notion that most Americans know that the system is already skewed unfairly. But what's most interesting to me is the reality compared to our perception. The ideal is as far removed from our perception of reality as the actual distribution is from what we think exists in this country. So ignore the ideal for a moment. Here's what we think it is again. And here is the actual distribution. Shockingly skewed. Not only do the bottom 20% and the next 20%, the bottom 40% of Americans barely have any of the wealth. I mean, it's hard to even see them on the chart, but the top 1% has more of the country's wealth than 9 out of 10 Americans believe the entire top 20% should have. Mind-blowing. But let's look at it another way, because I find this chart kind of difficult to wrap my head around. Instead, let's reduce the 311 million Americans to just a representative 100 people. Make it simple. Here they are. Teachers, coaches, firefighters, construction workers, engineers, doctors, lawyers, some investment bankers, a CEO, maybe a celebrity or two. Now let's line them up according to their wealth. Poorest people on the left, wealthiest on the right, just a steady row of folks based on their net worth. We'll color code them like we did before based on which 20% quintile they fall into. Now let's reduce the total wealth of the United States, which was roughly $54 trillion in 2009, to this symbolic pile of cash. And let's distribute it among our 100 Americans. Well, here's socialism, all the wealth of the country distributed equally. We all know that won't work. We need to encourage people to work and work hard to achieve that good old American dream and keep our country moving forward. So, here's that ideal we asked everyone about. Something like this curve. This isn't too bad. We've got some incentive as the wealthiest folks are now about 10 to 20 times better off than the poorest Americans. But hey, even the poor folks aren't actually poor since the poverty line has stayed almost entirely off the chart. We have a super healthy middle class with a smooth transition into wealth. And yes, Republicans and Democrats alike chose this curve. 9 out of 10 people, 92%, said this was a nice, ideal distribution of America's wealth. But let's move on. This is what people think America's wealth distribution actually looks like. Not as equitable, clearly, but for me, even this still looks pretty great. Yes, the poorest 20 to 30 percent are starting to suffer quite a lot compared to the ideal, and the middle class is certainly struggling more than they were, while the rich and wealthy are making roughly a hundred times that of the poorest Americans and about ten times that of the still healthy middle class. Sadly, this isn't even close to the reality. Here is the actual distribution of wealth in America. The poorest Americans don't even register. They're down to pocket change. And the middle class is barely distinguishable from the poor. In fact, even the rich between the top 10 and 20 percentile are worse off. Only the top 10 percent are better off. And how much better off? So much better off that the top 2 to 5 percent 
are actually off the chart at this scale. And the top 1%, this guy, well, his stack of money stretches 10 times higher than we can show. Here's his stack of cash, restacked, all by itself. This is the top 1% we've been hearing so much about. So much green in his pockets that I have to give him a whole new column of his own because he won't fit on my chart. 1% of America has 40% of all the nation's wealth. The bottom 80%, eight out of every 10 people, or 80 out of these 100, only has 7% between them. And this has only gotten worse in the last 20 to 30 years. While the richest 1% take home almost a quarter of the national income today, in 1976, they took home only 9% meaning their share of income has nearly tripled in the last 30 years. The top 1% own half the country's stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. The bottom 50% of Americans own only half a percent of these investments, which means they aren't investing. They're just scraping by. I'm sure many of these wealthy people have worked very hard for their money, but do you really believe that the CEO is working 380 times harder than his average employee? N not his lowest paid employee, not the janitor, but the average earner in his company. The average worker needs to work more than a month to earn what the CEO makes in one hour. We certainly don't have to go all the way to socialism to find something that is fair for hardworking Americans. We don't even have to achieve what most of us consider might be ideal. All we need to do is wake up and realize that the reality in this country is not at all what we think it is. First time I saw that video, I was stunned uh, because of the inequities that it that it showed. Uh, fortunately, we don't have that kind of wealth distribution in Canada. But I want to talk just a little bit about some of the things that have happened to shift this uh, the market, uh, and that we need to be wary of uh, as Canadians, because any market economy can be shifted like this. And I want to go back to that that part where the market is considered as not having anything to do with the moral realm until we get into the places where how, how money is distributed is controlled or overseen by particular bodies who then get to choose how that money is distributed. And in the United States in 1997 when the Glass-Steagall uh, Act was uh, changed and much of it was eliminated uh, and banks uh, that were for investment could then also speculate, uh, that had a major shift and there's a, an interesting uh, amalgamation between Deborah Warren and John McCain uh, to try to bring back some regulation around that. But taxation is a huge element of it where uh, individual taxpayers, just like you and I, pay our income taxes the way we're supposed to pay our income taxes, but the government provides a welfare uh, state for the corporation. And in order to stimulate uh, growth and speculation and uh, to make the market grow, uh, the government will allow massive uh, tax cuts for corporations. Uh, one of the conversations that was taking place at many of the tables and in the uh, large lectures at Chautauqua is what about taking away the rights of corporations to act as persons? Would that change the way that the market is happening now? I'm not an economist. I need, should have said that right at the very beginning. I am not an economist. But one of the things that I think is a big part of what happens when um, markets change and shift and, and e equality or equity is ch is challenged so incredibly is the idea of connection, a reconnection, a reappearance of a consumer in your own little bakery every Wednesday to pick up their bread for the weekend and every Monday to pick it up for the first half of the week. When we re-engage our clients, uh, we create a relationship that strengthens uh, and grows over time. We become more responsible because we know that they are going to go somewhere else if we don't deal with them properly. And we grow a little more courageous because we can depend upon the money that they're going to bring to us. It, the reconnecting over and over uh, with clients creates a stronger economy. 
As we move away from small towns and into urban settings, that gets a little complicated because you don't always see the baker, right? The baker is now having his bread picked up by a corporation that's putting it in the grocery store and you're buying it. So now your relationship of reconnecting is with a larger corporation, a, a multinational maybe even, that doesn't even function just in this country but may function in a number of countries. So you're going back and forth. It's a little less important that you always go to the same grocery store. You can go anywhere and so you're going to end up going to the place where you can find the groceries for the lowest price. When it comes to any of our goods, as uh, global uh, markets develop and, and the creation of things shifts offshore, it's even less likely that we are ever going to run into the person who is sewing our jeans together or making our shoes because they're in a country that we may never visit in all of our lifetime. So my desire when I go into the bakery to make sure that the baker is paying his assistant an appropriate amount of money and so the whole fairness around the whole community that that takes place, I can see that in my own community when it's a population of 3,000 people. When it's a population of 3 million people, it's a little harder. And when it's a global population of over 7 billion, it's almost impossible. And so it allows for uh, the parts of the market that can lead towards self-interest and, and a, a, a bloated self-interest to take over, particularly when the institutions that regulate them or the groups that oversee the redistribution of cash are playing a, to a particular group of people. The redistribution of cash from those who are poorest to those that are wealthiest is what has happened in the United States. We haven't seen that happen here, uh, but we are witnessing some changes in the market and in regulation that could very easily see us move in the same kind of, of direction. I want to talk a little bit about one of the things about the market system that sort of troubles me. The just market system that calls on us to be open and honest with one another, that challenges us to pay fairly, that expects, it, expects good work to be remunerated appropriately, that calls for commitment on the part of uh, those who may see a negative uh, investment for a little while, but a commitment to the broader goal to see it through and a lot of us, because of our distance from uh, the corporations that feed and clothe us, don't feel that kind of commitment very strongly. But one of the things that the market does that I think that would make for a very good conversation here is that the market rewards people for what they do rather than for who they are. Now, we know that we can settle that down to say, okay, so you get paid for what you do because you're good at it and not because you're the star surgeon or you're the star professor or you're the movie star star. You get paid because you do these things uh, rather than because of who you are. But in our world, we want to value people not just for what they do and what they produce, but for who they are. And that the the friction that lies between a market economy and those realities uh, that people are able to offer different things into community, and some none at all. Some are, are only able to allow us to hold and love them, and they aren't going to produce anything because of uh, addictions or mental health or physical incapacity or post-traumatic stress issues that they're not going to be the kind of functioning, doing, creating work workers that even the best market economy is going to value. And that is an issue that is going to have to, uh, we're, we're always going to have that challenge uh, as we live in this kind of an, of an economic reality. Morals have been the purview of religious institutions for a very long time. And as we have watched some of the changes take place in the United States, one of the things that we have seen happen uh, right alongside is a growth in fundamentalist religious values within the realm of the political. And the question that we must bring ourselves as we watch that happen, uh, and we have our own Office of Religious Freedoms right now, uh, and led by a, a conservative Christian, uh, 
principal of a very small Christian college in Ottawa, uh, with our own Office of Religious Freedoms, is what's the relationship between those two things, between the shift in an economy toward uh, corporate privilege and a shift in, in a political world toward uh, the privilege of, of religious perspectives? How do we uh, care for one another in, when an economy is perhaps going to treat people terribly and differently and we are reinforcing prejudices that religious uh, perspectives might launch as well. It seems like almost a perfect storm for that place for those who do not and cannot contribute equitably uh, to the system to be cut off the bottom of the chart and no longer have any significance whatsoever in our communities. I apologize for the head spaceness of this perspective. Coming from a week of lectures and conversations and engagement that is overwhelming, I fear that I may overwhelm you as well. But really all I want to do is offer the last words of Chris Hedges who was also one of the authors of a book studied by the book study. I go like this because they usually study in there, the book study. Um, his uh, I Don't Believe in Atheists book, um, which I didn't actually take him to task on, but um, he said, when someone said, what can we do? He said, pay attention. We've got to pay attention to what's happening in our, in our governments and to ensure that this market, which in small town America and small town Canada might have functioned beautifully with those leaders who were courageous and passionate and had justice that's their foremost principle and who hoped for something better uh, as they give way to markets that are controlled by groups that have their own interests at heart we have to pay attention so that when little things happen here and there they don't add up to a whole that's going to divide society take away the possibility for choice, reinforce a lack of concern for those who fall into poverty and cannot be productive uh, within the terms of the market's acceptance, and find ourselves in a world we no longer recognize. There's a lot of stuff on the table right now that we need to pay attention to, but as Chris Hedges spoke and, and talked about the changes that have taken place in the world as he has seen them from with a clarity that was brutal at times that he wants us to just pay attention is one of the most important things that came out of that week so i thank you for your forbearance i'll put the uh, video on the website or dana will put the video on the website uh, as well as perhaps the article which i actually had to pay for uh, i put the article on the website as well uh, and uh, hope they don't get mad at me for that and uh, and invite you to do just what it is that you do pay attention speak up uh, particularly uh, when those for whom you may be speaking have learned that they do not have a voice that they have been told that they do not have a voice and so cannot speak for themselves we must speak for them and with them and we must make sure that our society is one that values all that supports and enhances the well-being of all and that we find the ways to move toward that and not away from it. Thank you.